Hi, this is Billy Branch, and we're celebrating 60 years of the Chicago chapter, and this is part two of History's Chicago Blues. I'm Billy Branch, and I am a blues harmonica player. I've been performing Chicago blues close professionally close to 50 years. When I came on the scene, there weren't many young black harmonica players. I could have counted them on one hand. And um, not to say that the other harmonica players did not know and uh, completely revere these, these great artists, but I may have been the guy that's spent so much time with them, listening to them, following them, hanging with them, getting my head cut by them on a regular basis. I was just like a sponge and, and I, wherever the blues was and where those harp play, I, I was there. I'd be catching the L two, three in the morning to the west side by myself. I didn't, you know, and ne never had any incident. I wouldn't, wasn't afraid. I, I, I had to go learn this blues, man. I became a student of the blues. Jimmy Johnson uh, has said he remembered one thing he that stood out to him about me was that I always respected the older guys. And uh, that, that's something I felt that is that is a key to really understanding and effectively playing this music. Because as you know, a lot of people don't really understand the depth of the blues. They they kind of take it for granted. They say, yeah, it's easy. It's three chord changes, one, four, five. It's not easy to play this music. It's easy to play at it. You know, I was with the Willie Dixon Chicago Blues All-Stars for six years. Willie instilled in me that deep appreciation. And he was very proud that his people, African-Americans were the creators of this music that in turn became the foundation of all of America's music, which in turn, of course, influenced the world music scene. Notably, of course, but not only, but the whole rock and roll scene from the Stones, Led Zeppelin, Hendrix, and on and on. And Willie was acutely aware of that, and he was very proud of that. When I first started out, I was just, you know, like most musicians are, you're eager to play. The clubs that were around, no, the main one, of course, was uh, Teresa's Lounge, 48th in Indiana, Junior Wells' home base. At that time, I would hang out at the checkerboard on 43rd. I'd go uh, Peppers when it was on 13th in Michigan, then moved to 24th in Cottage, Florence's on 55th in Shields. And then these were all the black clubs. And then some years later, by about the uh, early mid 70s, the North Side scene started developing and growing. And, uh, Alice's Revisited was one of the first popular white-owned venues that featured blues. I mean, everybody played there. M Muddy may have played there, but Cotton, Kerry, Charlie Musselwhite, all the guys, Lefty Diaz. Sons of Blues came as a result of Jim and Amy O'Neill, which you know were the publishers and founders of Living Blues magazine. Everyone except for myself was the son of a famous blues musician. We had Freddie Dixon, of course, Willie's son, Lurie Bell, of course, Carrie Bell's son, and the drummer was Garland Whiteside, the son of Clifton James, who was Willie's drummer and Bo Diddley's original drummer. So I was the only one who wasn't the son of a famous blues musician, but I came up with the name and uh, that's how, and then shortly after that, we recorded for, for Alligator Records. I just encourage and exhort to please embrace the blues 
more strongly because this is where it all came from. We all know that the Rolling Stones got the name of their group from Muddy Waters' song, Rolling Stones. And happy 60th anniversary, but don't forget your blues.